Well, praise God. Good morning. I have um, three hours of scripture to get through this morning. So uh, I hope I can get done in, I don't know, 35 minutes now. So, but um, the answer to sin is found in your heart, I hope. The answer to sin, I hope, is found in your heart, is found in your life. And what's in your heart comes from the Word of God. I hope. I hope. And so that's what we're looking at, and that's what's going on. I want to open with a um, reading from about John Wesley. And... Um, Wesley in his journal, Mark and I, we've been talking about Wesley and some of his uh, early upbringings, and um, Wesley was really impacted by the Moravians, and they made a uh, real impact on what was going on in his life and in his heart, and one of the starting points here. Wesley was humbled by the conviction by Wesley was humbled by the conviction he lacked saving faith. Despite being an ordained priest in the Church of England, he was ordained in 1725. And serving as an overseas missionary, he recorded in his journal, immediately it struck into my mind. Leave off preaching. How can you preach to others who have not faith yourself? Wesley did not think he should preach about something he believed was true, but not himself experienced. And we talk about believing. We talk a lot about believing by faith, what we're living in and reading the Bible and believing. We've got to believe it even if we're not feeling it. But God gives us feelings. And then after we believe it, we've got to have a longing that I'm going to have an experience. Don't give up on belief because you don't have a feeling right away. But keep yearning Amen. to feel the presence of God in your life. And that was what Wesley was saying. I'll go on and, and the date here will shock you when Wesley Got the feeling. Um, Wesley did not think he should preach about something he believed was so true, but not himself experienced. Bowler, one of the Moravians that he grew very fond of, however, encouraged Wesley to preach faith till you have it. And then because you have it, you will preach faith. As Wesley's relationship with Bowler continued to develop, the two of them eventually formed a new religious society or a band or the class meeting, which was what Wesley brought about in the small groups in which we, as the men, are joining together the band of brothers, class of brothers. And... So it was called the Fetter Lane Society. And through this relationship and in this context, Wesley had his famous heartwarming experience at Alters Gate Street, May 24th, 1738. Remember, Wesley was ordained 1725. He didn't feel it until 1738. And then... The Spirit moved upon Wesley, and Wesley was filled with fire and passion. I go on, he goes on, I want to read this part. Uh, can I skip over any of this? A key moment for Wesley was when he preached his servant, sermon, Salvation by Faith, at St. Mary's, Oxford, 1738. In the sermon, Wesley confronted many members of the Church of England with their nominal faith. He preached that saving faith 
is not barely a a speculative, rational thing, a cold, lifeless ascent, a train of ideas in the head, but also a disposition of the heart. In this sermon, he also offered one of his best-known definitions of justification by faith. It is a sure confidence which a man hath in God that through the merits of Christ, his sins are forgiven. The answer to the question that Wesley said that through the merits of Christ, his sins are forgiven and he reconciled to the favor of God and in consequence hereof, a closing with him and a cleaving to him as as our wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption, or in one word, our salvation. So God in his loving kindness, the answer for sin, God in his loving kindness, mercy, and grace provided the solution to sin through the atoning sacrifice of his son. So you all know this. But how are we applying this? How are we coming into agreement with the Word in the society that we're living in, in the situations that we're in? So Matthew 26, 27, and 28 says, And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is being poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Jesus' sacrifice was being poured out and given for the forgiveness of our sins. Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 9 says, For while we were still helpless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly, For one will hardly die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. So as we take this in to our heart, as we realize that God is providing a way, God is providing the answer to sin. Sin is real. I've talked about it for a couple weeks now. Sin is real. And it's the, it's the devil's ammunition. It's the devil's plan to keep us from walking with God to keep us going forward with God, to take us out, to remove us from the church. And so that's the plan of the enemy. But God, Jesus, is the solution. Romans 6, a lot of us know Romans 6, which is good. And uh, these are familiar verses to us all. But the application process is necessary. If, if we don't apply it, it's not going to be useful to the overcoming process that's needed to fight against the enemy. Therefore, what benefit were you then deriving from the things which you are now ashamed. So the things of sin, the things that we're ashamed of, what benefit are they providing for you? It might last for a short instance. It might be something really good for a second. But what lasting benefit is it providing to you? For the outcome of those things is death. The outcome of the things of sin is death. That's the plan of the enemy. But now, having been freed from sin and enslaved to God, 
You derive your benefit. Wait a minute. Let's back up. But now having been freed from sin and enslaved to God, are you willing to be a slave for God? I mean, we've got to consider what's before us. And are we willing to let God reign and rule in our lives in order to follow him? Because if not, you derive your benefit. It's from God through Jesus that we derive our benefit resulting in sanctification and the outcome eternal life. Familiar verse 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gracious gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So when we take this into our heart and we appropriate it, it's got power. When you sing there's power in the blood, it has meaning. If you don't apply this, and if you don't take it in the heart, meaning go and sin no more, then the blood doesn't have the power that you're desiring. Juanita? Yeah. Yeah. And that's what you would be, but the uh, devil wants us to think we're in God when we're really not, and we're, which would be lukewarm, and we're, we're caught in the middle, we're deceived. Uh, Teresa. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. That's what I was going to say. Yeah. Right. Renewing of our mind. Right. 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 God's looking to give us and wants us to have the mind of Christ as you're talking about that our heart's being changed. And then... You know, are we lining up? What would G, you know, the bracelet? What would Jesus do? Is that lining up with us? What would Jesus do? Yes. And, and Peter denied Jesus. I would say that's pretty significant. Yeah. But his response to it, what right. was Judas's response to it? Hopelessness. Yes. You know, taking his own life. So all of those men sinned. Yes. But their response to it. Right. Is what I think is the difference here. And right. And I guess that's the heart. Right. So, yeah. It's our heart. It's our focus. And we've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And we may fall again. But are we going to love God? And is, are we going to love each other? And we're going to pick each other up? And are we going to continue to encourage each other and build the body of Christ? Because that's what Jesus wants us to have. I mean... 
you know, they didn't write off Wesley because he wasn't feeling it. He was saying the words. He was saying the right thing, but he had no, no uh, feeling of what he was saying. They didn't write him off. And it went on for 13 years before he had an experience of God. And then Wesley's heart was strangely warmed and God moved. Teresa? Right. It's the heart. The longing for more of him and less of me. Right. Amen. Which brings about the transformation. This which brings about the hunger and the desire that is stirred up from the inside out. Right. To know more about him. Right. And we do veer off. We do have journeys that's up and down and in and out. As with Samson. Yeah. But when he came to himself. Amen. Amen. Audrey. Amen, Teresa. Right. Right. If you didn't hear what Audrey was saying, somebody had to tell Wesley about the heart experience because he was living under the rules of England and the Church of England, and not experiencing a heart movement. He also, though he was a missionary, he did not have success. Right. He was frustrated. Yeah. Ran by being there. Yeah. Amen. Um, right. Yeah. There was a stirring... Amen. There was a stirring, and that's why we can't give up on somebody. And we can't, we can't say, oh, it's not going to happen. Well, it will happen if we keep trusting and believing in God that God's faithful to fulfill his plan. Amen. Amen. Yes. Amen. 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 See, you all are getting, you all are getting this, but uh, you're making it, huh? It's, yeah. Yeah. And what he wanted us to hear. Amen. 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 Praise God. Y'all are y'all are making it hard for me to get through um, what I need to get through. Go ahead. <laughs> Praise God. Because this is an impact on what's going on. Uh, Romans 8. Another familiar scripture, right? Very first verse, but let's get a couple more that may not be as familiar. Therefore, there is now no condemnation at all for those who are in Christ Jesus. So there's the first part. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death in your heart. The law that's going on in your heart in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did, sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. 
so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Remember, Jesus said, I did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. So the way that it is fulfilled by us today is not through 300, I mean 613 laws. It's by one, and his name's Jesus. And when we apply Jesus, we fulfill the law in, in our flesh. Put on a new nature. Ephesians 1, 7. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our wrongdoings according to the riches of his grace. Jesus came to set us free from sin and the curse of death. 1 John 1, 7. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So what's the condition here? What do we got to do? Walk with him. Walk in the light. And then he's going to do the work. He's going to keep us free. He's going to keep us set apart in walking in the victory that he has for us. But how's, how's the devil... Fight against that. Oh no, you got to do things yourselves. You got to do the things you want to do. You got to go the way you want to go. And then our flesh tries to take over, and then we get in the situation we're in of dealing with our flesh. First uh, John 3 3 through 10. And everyone who has this hope set on him purifies himself just as he is pure. Everyone who practices sin also practices lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. You know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who remains in him sins continually. No one who sins continually has seen him or knows him. Little children, Make sure no one deceives you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. The one who practices sin is of the devil. For the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The Son of God appeared for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. No one who has been born of God practices sin because his seed remains in him. And he cannot sin continually because he has been born of God. By this, the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor the one who does not love his brother or sister. God's doing a great work in us and through us. Um, I still have quite a few to go, so I want to get... I want to get through these because uh, next week I'd like to uh, move in a little different direction. When we do fall short of the mark as Christians, we have a faithful advocate to whom we can confess our sins and receive his loving forgiveness. 1 John 1.8, if we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous so that he will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. My little children, I am writing these things to, to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. So we intercede for our brothers and sisters. We intercede for each other, that we would be made right and brought into a right relationship with Jesus Christ as we walk with him. We praise God in his absolute sinless perfection because he loves us. 
John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. You know that. That's his perfection and his purpose for us. 1 John 4, 7, and 8. Beloved, let's love one another. For love is from God. And everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God. Because God is love. 10 and 11. In this in this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to love one another. God wants us to be filled with his love. If we can't love somebody, then we need to come before God so that God would fill us up. God would fill our cup up so that God's love comes forth in all that's going on. He revealed the magnitude of, of his love by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners, Romans 5, 8. For God made Christ who never sinned to be an offering for our sin so that we could be made right with God through Christ. Second, that was from 2 Corinthians 5.21. So think about what Christ is doing in us. Think about what Christ wants to do in your heart. Where are you in relationship to everything that's going on? And what's taking place? Are you calling out for God? Are you calling out? And God's calling us to make a difference, to go forth into this world. Um... We're going to look at God's kingdom in the next hour. And then we're going to study God's kingdom, maybe for the next couple weeks. But we're looking at God's kingdom. And how can we look at God's kingdom, thy will be done, if our heart is not right with God? If our heart's right with God... Then we can look at God's word and say, God, we pray, we intercede for the, thy kingdom. We're not coming to judge people. God's the judge. Lord, how can I make a difference as a kingdom person? How can I make a difference as a person that's been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb? Not to say I'm not a sin, not to say I'm not a sinner. No, we've all sinned and fall short of glory of God. What we come before and say is that we, I've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. You can say, if you've got Jesus in your heart, I've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. And so what difference is that going to make in other people's lives? What difference is that going to make in Bethesda Church? What influence is that going to have on people? If we're taking and having our hearts transformed and renewed into the image of God, I believe it'll have a dynamic change on what's going on in our lives, in society, in people, where you work, where you live, where you move, how you're talking to people, how you're talking to your children, how you're educating your grandchildren, how you're loving on everybody. It, can you imagine if Jesus was here? What would be different? What would be different if Jesus was here? You know, think about it. Man, what would, what, what would it be like if Jesus was here? I believe he's here now. Well, that's what, I'm, that's what I was getting ready to say, Al, because I wanted you to think about that. Okay, well, what if Jesus is here? Nicole, you focused or are you just drinking your coffee and smiling? Okay. I know you are. If Jesus is right here and Jesus is right here and Jesus is right there and Jesus is here, what difference is Jesus making? What difference is the church making? 
Why do you think the church is under such attack? Why do you think we're in a battle right now to stand up for the Word of God as believers of Bethesda? If we would just drop the Word and flow along with everything else that's going on, we wouldn't be in the battle we're in. You know what? I bet you we'd have a lot more people in here than we have right now. You know that? I really, be- I almost believe the church, we might have to bring in extra chairs if we drop the Word. And... If I did what Wesley was saying and I stopped preaching the Word of God, if I stopped that, I believe we might have a few more people in here. Okay? Yeah. But that's not what God's calling us to. God's calling us to be set apart. How are we going to be set apart if we don't know the Word of God? God's calling us to know His Word, to know His truth, and then to apply it to our lives and then invite others to come along and say, hey, let's look at this together. That's why Wesley had the classes and bands to say, let's look at this word together. Let's study this word together and see how it applies to our lives and how it will make a difference. In Christ, we are washed, sanctified, and justified. 1 Corinthians 6.11 So in Christ, think of it. There's a new car wash in Mount Airy. Just think about it. I asked Rose, I said, you know, we ought to go through there and leave the windows down. We could do the outside and the inside. And uh, she said no. And, uh, but think about it. If you got on the belt and you went through that car wash, you know, it talks about it in Scripture, just having the outside washed. But what about the inside? What about our hearts? Because out of the heart, the mouth speaks. Out of the heart, we have a, a, a voice. Out of our heart, we speak. And we share either the love of God or we share from our flesh. It's like Juanita was saying, either heaven or hell. And we're either sharing Jesus or we're not. Teresa, a clean heart and renew a steadfast spirit in me. It, amen. Amen. No, 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 you're good. If we have a clean heart, Audrey's saying God's going to do the work. He's going to bring in the sheaves. But we got to be there. Yeah, we got to do it. We got to do it. Audrey's saying, Audrey's telling you all, let's do it. Okay? Um, who else? Yeah, I got something that Jeremiah 17, verse 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately Yes. Yeah. Right. That's the heart of flesh. I, I, I really believe that the Lord that I've mm. said, he says, search your heart and see. Yeah, Lord. I will reveal to you the Glory wickedness to of your own heart. Created me a clean heart. It doesn't, he won't do it overnight, but as you walk with as him, walk. as you walk with him, he'll reveal the sin. And what does he want us to do? To repent of that sin, walk in repentance. And then yeah. apply and believe the promise in First John 1, 9. Thank you, thank you. He is thank faithful you. and just to forgive us from all sin. Thank you, thank you. If we God. confess our sins, yes, 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 yes. Amen. The blood of Jesus. Amen. Amen. I believe, based on the teachings we've had here for many years, that's the Christian life. Hallelujah. We have to walk in that way. Walk the walk. And when we're repenting heart, when we're convinced of any sin, even though, what do you call it, a little tiny little thing, a sin, even that is so concerned about Yes, sin. yes, yes. Talk to us. So, and when, then we can all agree what Paul said. Why is it that I do those things I don't want to do? Uh-huh. I find Bro, myself Bro, doing them anyway. Oh, yeah, that's the man that I am. Right. Oh, to God. Right. right. Now, you got to believe that. Yeah. Amen. 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 And we got to keep praying. And then prayer, why isn't everybody running to have their heart changed? Because the enemy's at work and we're in warfare. We've talked about being in warfare. And that's where prayer comes in. Prayer. 
touch the hearts of our people. We've got a nation, Lord God, right now that's in a mess. People are running toward money. They're running away from God. They're not running to God. And we're seeing the consequences. We're seeing what's taking place. So God, move in this land. Move. And that's where we pray. And that's where you've got to believe. And you're not seeing any difference. But that's where faith comes in. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous person avails much. And that's why we got to keep praying. That's why we got to keep calling out to God. I only have a couple more minutes. Four second buzzer. Let me uh, finish up here. Um, he's showing mercy. And how can we not praise and thank God for this gift too wonderful for words? 2 Corinthians 9.15 If we understand in our heart the magnitude of this gift, how can we not praise Him? How can we not thank Him? Even in the midst of a battle, even in the midst of things that are going on, that we've got to come and praise God. We've got to thank God. And, and God, if we thank You, if we come and trust You, God's going to raise us up. God's going to lift us up and bring change out of this thing. God, I praise you. I praise you for the struggle that we're in. God, you're in control. You're in charge. You're going to be the glory and the lift of my head. I can't do it, but you can. God, Roy said to just pray for him and Joan. Lord God, because they're believing that God... You're taking them through something. And they're believing that something great is going to come out of it. Because they're trusting in God. And so that's what we believe. And that's what we hold on to. While we were running away from him in complete rebellion. Think about this. While we were running away, no hope, complete rebellion. He called us out of darkness into his wonderful light to become God's very own possession so that we might show others the goodness of God. We know the first part of 1 Peter 2.9 because we say it a lot. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. But then the second part, we don't really say that or emphasize it too much so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So that you may proclaim, I was once in darkness, but now I'm in light. Look at what the light is doing in my life. Look at what is happening. And not, to, not from a place of pride, but if you, if you show the light from a place of humility, then people are going to look and say, uh, what about this light? How can I have some light? Because guess what? We are living in darkness. And who wouldn't want to be involved in light? And then we've got to stand beside some people that want to be with light because it's going to be hard to snatch them, I believe it says in Scripture, snatching them out of the fire. It's not just darkness, but it's a fire that continually burns. And it burns up the light so there's no light. And so we're going to have to stand along beside people as we continue to stand on this Word and be who God's called us to be. In closing, Hebrews 4.16 there we will receive his mercy, and we will find grace to help us when we need it most. Hallelujah. Hebrews 4.16. God, we thank you for your grace and your mercy, that you'll give us what we need the most when we need it, because you're always faithful when we give our hearts to you in full assurance. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. Praise God.